All right, so we're talking about simple cubic packing structures. We're talking about the structures of solids. And solids, of course, are defined as solids because they exist in a three-dimensional repeating unit. Now, it's a little bit confusing last night what that actual unit is. How does that unit repeat if we're going to be borrowing atoms from one side of that? So before we get to that, I want to get to the important connections between what you did last night, which seems so far removed from what we're actually doing in class. We just finished electrolytic cells and we talked about oxidation reduction. Why are we doing uh, looking at the structures of solids? Well, in all of our redox reactions, and a lot of them, the solids actually oxidized. They lost electrons. And you should know why, okay? You know that the big atoms, okay, exist farther away, at least their electrons exist farther away than their protons. In a nucleus, you have the protons, and then we have these outermost electrons. Well, big atoms, because of Coulomb's law, this distance or radius between the electron and that proton are so far away, so far away, as the distance increases based on Coulomb's law, the force of attraction decreases, and it's easier for these electrons to be lost. Losing electrons, oxidation. Very important that we understand that. Now we know the elements that love to reduce, okay, gain electrons. They're the smaller atoms. Now again, why do we care about the structure? Well, the structure by which these atoms exist can affect their ability to lose electrons, okay? Especially if you mix other atoms or different elements in that structure called alloys, which you'll be doing tonight for homework or this weekend. Now, let's take a review back through things we've learned already. So let's take a look back on the periodic table, okay? And let's take a look here. Um, And let's take a look right here, the periodic table. Now, in this periodic table, I drew a little staircase. And this staircase sometimes is really emboldened on a lot of periodic tables. What's important, if you remember uh, the things that we've learned over the summer or in another class, is that this is kind of like the divider between the big atoms and the small. We learned that as we go across a row in the same energy level, you're adding more protons. As you add more protons, due to Coulomb's law, you're increasing the charge number, electrons get attracted more and more and more and more. And therefore, the elements that attract electrons, and thus are smaller, and thus are best at reducing, are up to the right. The elements, as they get bigger and have a low number of protons in their energy level, and we'll talk more about this in another part of the course, electrons are bigger. So, over to the left and down, you're bigger. Over to the right and up, you're smaller. But where is that dividing line? Well, these are called metalloids, and they have properties of both. And we'll talk more about them. But essentially, this is the dividing line. Boron, silicon, arsenic, tellurium, germanium, antimony. They're kind of in between. So anything above them are the smallest atoms that are good at reducing. Hey, look at oxygen. That's our best oxidizing agent, right? Great at pulling electrons from things. Itself great at reducing or getting reduced. And then these are the big atoms. Notice that most of the periodic table are metals. Now, as I said many times, all right, if I have an electrolytic cell, okay, I can force metals that are not good at oxidizing to do that. But I can really never force uh, naturally a, a metal to become negatively charged. You'll never find, you'll never find a metal with a negative oxidation state. So let's take a look. These are the charges that these atoms love to become. Love to become, they don't tell you. Atoms are neutral. I say atom, you say neutral. That means the proton number 21 equals the electron number, right? This is the mass number, it's the protons and neutrons. We'll learn why it's got a decimal place. But right now, in this periodic table that I allow you to use, it tells you what charge these elements love to become. Well, because all of these guys are what? South of the Mason-Dixon line, they're south of being big, uh, of being small, that means these are all big atoms. These are all metals. And you can't find me a metal that becomes negatively charged. We've dealt with copper. We saw zinc. These guys, you can't find. Now you may say, Mr. Grodsky, I see one way over here that's negative. Hydrogen, 
is actually a non-metal. They put it over there because of one valence. So with that in mind, metals lose electrons. Their ability, though, can be hampered, OK, or not by their, their, their crystalline structure. So it's important for us to look, start looking at the atoms and their, their structures. Why? Because there's a big part of chemistry called metallurgy where they mix different atoms into different uh, crystal arrangements to change the properties of metals. They're called alloys. It's a big part of chemistry where they will mix a little bit of one metal into another and that changes the properties of the metal in ways that could stop oxidation or improve them. Case in point, I'm sure everyone now has a stainless steel appliance in their house or has seen one or been around one. What is stainless steel? Well, steel is nothing more than iron and a little bit of carbon, but more importantly, stainless steel is a type of iron that doesn't rust very easily. That's why it's stainless. Stainless just means it doesn't make any rust markings. Well, why? It's because stainless steel is made of iron. Now, this is a salt, but it's made of iron with chromium atoms intertwined in its crystalline structure. Now, the chromium has to fit in the, in the, in the structure of the um, a crystal to fit, but it changes the properties that we'll learn of iron so that it doesn't easily oxidize with oxygen and therefore it stays stainless or unreactive. And therefore you can shine it and it's not gonna rust. Now it doesn't always work over time. It can lose that chromium layer or that chromium. But the point is we can change the properties. We can affect, okay? We learned that aluminum, or for from England, aluminum, okay, is pretty darn reactive, but it makes its salt or its rust fits nicely into the structure. So as aluminum rusts and reacts with oxygen, it coats itself in a way that there's no more aluminum exposed and it stops any further oxidation. That was one of our problems in using aluminum in the battery. As it oxidizes, it was forming an oxide layer, which is a rust layer. Now I wanna bring in the word rust. What is rust? People think of rust as iron oxide. What does that mean? That means that we had good old iron, it was a metal, it was zero, okay? Exposed to hua, who, hua, hua, <laughs> exposed to oxygen, okay, who's small, this guy grabbed the electrons, became negative two. Iron became plus two or plus three, and they stuck together to form a new compound called iron two oxide or iron three oxide, depending upon the charge of the iron. That's rust. We think of only rusted, but you know what this is? It's a salt. A salt is when you have a positive ion attracting a negative ion, and they always make what? Solid crystal arrangements because positive negative ions, based on Coulomb's law, attract so greatly they're going to stick and make a crystal. But think about sodium chloride. What's sodium chloride? Isn't it Na plus? Attract the Cl negative. Here's an example of what the salt structure or the simple cubic structure of salt could be. It's table salt. Sodium and chlorine. And it repeats. But really, what's sodium chloride, table salt? Well, it's Na plus one. How'd that get there? Pure solid sodium would have had to lose its electrons, not to oxygen, but to another small element. <gasps> chlorine. Chlorine took the electron from sodium. It's the rust of sodium when exposed to chlorine. All ionic compounds, positive and negative ions, are solids unless they're dissolved, if they're soluble, okay, or solids at room temperature. You need a tremendous amount of heat to separate them. But what are all ionic compounds? Some metal that lost electrons to some non-metal who's good at gaining them and made charges and they stick together in a crystal. So there's all different forms of rust. We eat rust. Sodium chloride, table salt, is an example of a form of rust. We have a fancy word for them. We call them ores, okay? What's an ore? Well, iron ore. We get iron ore out of the ground. What's iron ore? Well, essentially iron ore is iron that has already reacted, gave up its electrons to usually oxygen because there's a lot of that in our environment, and so we have iron oxides. We, we can't dig out pure iron, but we need pure iron to build our, car, well, build our cars and our infrastructure, our, our bridges and everything else. So what do they do with it? They smelt it. They do electrolysis. They force electrons back on it to make the pure metal. 
We purify it. Same thing with aluminum. We get aluminum ore. What's aluminum ore? Hey, it's aluminum that's what charge? Aluminum oxide. And electrolysis, we make the pure aluminum. So the ores that we get out of the ground are the salts or the what? Rusted forms of the metals after they've oxidized, okay? Anyway, knowing their structure is important. Think about iron oxides, the rust of iron. We know that because of the structure of iron oxide, it's so different than the structure of pure iron crystals that when you make it, it kind of exposes more iron. You've seen iron oxide or rust in old cars. I don't know if you've probably done this, but you can be a finger through the fender. It keeps exposing more iron layers because the salts, what? The salt or the iron oxide layer has a different arrangement than the iron, different than aluminum. Aluminum's oxide or its salt layer is almost the same, so it coats. So knowing the structure and, 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 and working with this structure is really important understanding its behavior in redox reactions, besides just knowing the voltage, okay? It's important because the structure of atoms gives that compound its properties. Just You can't just say what's the atom, what's its structure? And for those in AP Bio, you know that with me. Structure is king. We talked about proteins. The protein structure, three-dimensional, gave the properties of that. Well, in chemistry, the atoms themselves are interesting, and they do have their own properties, but their structure gives them their chemical properties as well. Okay. So, back to reality. Where are we? Okay, let's go back to the website. Formations. We have the simple that we talked about. The body center, you still have atoms in the corner, but one in the middle. They have the face center, hard to see here, but get the one in the face. And then there's also some other ones that are not quite, um, at, they're not in high quantity. So the, the most important ones are the simple, the body, and the face center. And we'll see those examples in a second. Um, it's important to realize that we know these structures, yet we can't see atoms. How do we know these structures are face-centered, are body-centered, or simple structures? Well, we use something called X-ray crystallography, okay? And X-ray crystallography is made famous by, of course, finding this X pattern, which is the double helix signature of a crystallography uh, picture that we take by shooting X-rays at a certain angle at a solid and these patterns called diffracting patterns, with some math, you can figure out the distances. Let me talk about that for a second. Um, again, the most famous picture, okay, is I think picture 52, I believe, that was stolen from Rosalind by um, uh, Crooks and um, Wilkins um, to build their model of DNA. It was her work that they used, her crystallography picture that was clear enough to show them that they had to build a double helix. Okay, but in any case, that being said, um, let's go to, um, this is gonna be uh, black, here we go. I'm gonna give you a little demonstration here, maybe. Okay, so there's a little demonstration. So I'm gonna use this. All right, so what I have here is I have a green laser, okay, laser pointer, and I'm gonna point it through two slits, okay? And we're gonna talk more about this when we get to electromagnetism and, and um, um, light in this course. But more importantly, here is the demo. I have a, a, a diffracting gradient. Basically, I have something with two slits, okay? It's kind of like if I had water, and I'm gonna push the water through these openings. Well, I have two openings in that, um, that little card there that I'm gonna push uh, light through. Now, of course, what we know what's going to happen is we're going to make some waves happen. And the waves are going to get bigger. And they'll propagate. And I'm not making exactly the picture I want, but you get the idea. Okay, not bad. All right, now, what's going to happen when you push two waves to an opening through wave behavior, is there's gonna be places where the waves directly overlap. That's called waves going in phase. And I know it's leaning to the left, but here is where we're gonna have the biggest wave. And you're gonna see a big brightness on the screen because that's where you have what we call constructive interference. 
two waves coming together makes a bigger wave. Now, we also have it right here. And it'll happen here, which means you'll have another peak. If you notice something, the peak's gonna be a little smaller, but there's a place in between these two places where one wave of another is gonna cancel out the other wave of another. It's called destructive interference. Okay? And so what we're gonna have what we're gonna have is we're gonna have places of peaks and valleys. The valleys are where the waves cancel themselves out. The best way to draw that a wave cancels themselves out is hey, here's a sine wave. If I put another sine wave directly on top of this one, let's make it orange. If it's in phase, it's gonna make both of these waves get bigger and have amplification. And that's what's happening right here. It's called constructive interference. Okay, now if I do this again, let's draw the sine wave again, and now let's draw it completely out of phase. The next wave comes out of phase. What's happening there? Well, this positive wave will be canceled out by this negative wave, and there'll be, there'll be what? No wave left. So this would be complete canceling. That's what's happening in between. And that's why you see this. So we're gonna see some bright light at the peaks. It's gonna steadily decrease. And the distance between these dots, these bright lines, based upon the type of light I use, the angle by which the light hits the openings, I can actually measure the distance between the atoms in a simple cubic structure. Amazing. By measuring the light patterns, knowing the angle of incidence, okay, using the type of, I'm not gonna use x-rays for obvious reasons. I'm gonna use green light, which is, so, uh, and knowing that information, I can measure those, this brightness patterns or diffracting patterns and I can work that back mathematically to what the distance is and where they are in a crystal. Pretty darn amazing, okay? So body-centered, face-centered, give a different arrangement, but we can actually measure those distances. And that distance, by the way, between here and here, is called a lattice constant. You know what a lattice constant is? It's the size of this dimension in that simple cubic structure. That lattice constant is that nice little what? Length, height, or width of the cube. Since it is a cube, it's the same dimension. Shining light, okay, gives us this pattern. You say, Mr. Grodsky, why is there openings? The crystal isn't perfect. There's gonna be openings between atoms, okay? And it's a calculation you'll see in an advanced physics class called Bragg's Law. But in any case, I'm gonna hold this down, and again, if you just see me for a second, this is just a regular run of them, so you can see my laser. It's one dot. I'm gonna shoot it through a double slit. And you can see the, 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 the patterns. It's, you see that dot in the middle? It's brightest. Then the ones to the right get dimmer, dimmer until it disappears. It's actually Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, but the spaces between the dots is where there's destructive interference. If we measure, if we measure the distances between those dots, using the light and the angle I'm hitting it, I can actually work back to the distances between the slits. Same thing here. That's the cool part. All right, so that's how they work the mathematics to get these structures. Let's go get some calculations done, because that's what got a lot of people last night. So let's go to um, the first calculation, which is um, this, and I'm going to clear this out with my pen of Apple. Um, okay, and I think I'm going to get rid of it. X it out. Oh. 
Christmas in July. All right, so I'm just gonna get my work done because I wanna start from scratch here. Okay, so in this problem here, can anyone identify what kind of close packing structure I have? Not all at once, it's crazy. Well, we've got inside the body, we've got one atom. This is a body center, okay? So I'll write that. Okay, what would this one be? Face centered. Face centered, right. On the sides, you have half, so this is face centered. And now we get a different pattern of dots. And of course, this one is still face centered as well. Okay, let's go back to our body center. Okay, here's the question. All right. Here's the question. Calculate the density of chromium by using the crystal lattice structure. It was determined by x-ray crystallography the lattice constant is 291 picometers. Okay, the distance between the light patterns represents what? So what is the crystal lattice? What is the, this is right here. This distance is the lattice constant. So this 291 picometers is this. It's also this. Remember, it's a cube. Also this, so we know the distance of one of the dimensions of this close packing structure. Okay, that's important. Now, by shining light on chromium, getting the dots, doing the mathematics, and getting our um, distance in this close packing structure for our body centered, we wanna just solve for the density. By shining light on chromium, I want to see if I can find its density. Okay, because the pattern gave me a body-centered pattern, I'm going to start with densities. People say, I don't know where to start here. What do you do last? It's not what you do first, it's what you do last. I'm asking for what? Density. So last thing in this problem, what am I going to do? Take density, which I know is equal to mass, over volume. This is not our science. We're not dropping chromium in water, watching the water displace up, measuring the displacement of water, and then put that chromium on a scale and measuring mass. We're going to do this by shining light on chromium, understanding, okay, the arrangement. So the first thing, okay, let's get the mass part. We're going to get the mass of this close packing structure, this unit cell of a body center, okay? Now, how many atoms are in a body center? How many total atoms? You got, yeah, you got one in the middle, and you got four eighths. So there's two atoms here. So that's important. So we know that this is two atoms. All right. To get the mass of this unit cell, I need the mass of two atoms. All right. Well, because of mole theory, I know the mass of a lot of atoms. So I'm going to start with that. So I go to my periodic table, OK? And I have it here somewhere. Periodic table, here we go. I'm gonna go find chromium. That's its atomic number. That's the ions they like to become as a metal loses and becomes positive. That's the atomic mass. And we made that the mass of one mole. I'm gonna round it to 52 to make things a little more simpler. Okay, so 52 grams equals what Faraday called the equivalent of chromium, one mole of chromium. So 52, let's go back to our problem. So I'm gonna start this way. I'm gonna take 52 grams of chromium, and it's per what? One mole. Now, party people, I want it per two atoms. This is the amount of grams for a lot of them. Now, here comes a new word. Avogadro's number. Someone figured out, after they decided that we were gonna use this as the equivalent, someone figured out by many experiments, what exactly is that number that a mole equals? Remember, a mole is a word that describes how many. 
We use dozen for eggs as 12. We say, hey, I have three dozens. Well, it's three times 12 because a dozen is 12. A mole represents some bigger number because these things are so small. And it's that number I have on the board, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. So I'm going to get rid of mole. One mole is equal to the exact number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23, and that's atoms. And so really what I'm doing by dividing, oops, by dividing by this actual number for mole, I'm finding the grams per one atom. Hey, if I have a mass of a bunch of eggs and I know the dozen, gram per dozen, I put 12 here for a dozen, I can find the mass per one egg. Okay, so moles go bye-bye. But wait a minute, don't lose sight. We're trying to, we need the mass of what? Two atoms, don't we? Right? So what do you think I'm going to do with this after I find this number? Times it by? Two. Two. And that will give me the mass of two atoms. All right. So here's what we do. Now, when you're dealing with numbers with exponentials, okay, and a lot of people in math downstairs use the carrot key. And I'm okay if you use the carrot key, but sometimes the carrot key gets you into some sticky scenarios because the carrot key, which is 10 to the carrot key, sometimes isn't stuck with the exponential. For instance, if we're dealing with Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Carrot, you go 10 to the carrot key, 23, good. But if you got this number in front, sometimes this computer doesn't tie this together with this number. And if you do orders of operations, you always do the exponent first and it doesn't connect it. So I always suggest my students for not to have orders of operation errors to tie the exponential, okay, with the number in front. The best way is to use the EE key. So let me show you how to use it. Because I'm telling you, you're gonna have errors if you stay with the carrot key. Not sure why the math people don't teach that. Okay, here's an application of math. So I'm gonna type in Avogadro's number, okay? And I'm gonna show you how I do that. You may already know this, but it's really important to stay away from some easy errors, okay? All right, some points, I'm gonna get small here. All right, here we go. Okay, so. I'm going to type in 6.02, and I'll put my glasses on. <laughs> 6.02-er. Now, I'm going to tie, how about I turn it on first? <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's a great demo, Grotsky, but turn the darn thing on. Okay. Let's go clear this, baby. All right. Now, let's go 6.02. 6.02. All right, that's easy. Now I'm gonna go second function, that's the yellow key, and I'm gonna touch this EE -E button, exponential, okay? And now what it gets me, it gets me 6.02, there's an E that's blinking. What does that really mean? It means 6.02 times 10, and what's blinking is the exponent. It says exponent of base 10. That E is exponent of base 10. So we just type in 23. And you can enter if you want, and it comes out nice and pretty. E to the 23 is 10 to the 23. Okay, great. Now, since I already have it in there, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna divide by 52. I know it's really 52 divided by that, but since I had this number in, I'm gonna divide by 52. It's gonna give me the inverse of my answer, right? So I'm just going to do that. I already have this typed in. So I'm going to divide by 52. So divide by 52. This is not really the answer. But you guys should know when you're dealing with this, sometimes it's easy to do this. So I have it the wrong way. So to flip it around, I hit the inverse key, negative 1. Okay? So to get the right answer, x to the negative 1. And now I have the right answer. And so... That is 8.64 times 10 to the negative 23, okay? And does that make sense? What do, I, what do I solve for? Grams per atom. That's a tiny number. It's going to be tiny. We have a mass of one atom, okay? That's tiny. 
It's extremely Italian, but what do we need? So I got to times it by two, don't forget. Two times two. I do it for the other class, because they, they make sure I get it right. All right. So and I times two, and so my answer party people is I get the mass of two atoms to be, I'm going red now, okay, is 1.73 times 10, the E is exponent, base 10, negative 22, and that's grams. All right, that's not too difficult. We divide by Avogadro's number to get it per. That's an AP skill right there, okay? Now we need the volume. Well, the crystallography actually by the Bragg's Law math that we talked about gets me this um, dimension. Well, what's volume? Length times width times height. Careful, careful, careful. If you take these picometers and you cube them, you're gonna get picometers, picometers cubed. And that's a hard conversion back into what we want. We want this to be centimeters cubed. Centimeters cubed. All right, so I suggest that we convert to centimeters and then we cube it, okay? So watch how I do this. Now, first of all, what's a picometer? Well, one picometer is equal to one times 10 to the negative 12 meters. Now, I'm not a big fan of how it's written this way. So I'm gonna do it the other way. I know that one meter is equal to one times 10 to the 12 picometers. See, I like this one. I'll explain. They both do the same thing, but picometers are tiny. They are one billionth of a meter in distance. Standard unit of the unit is meter. They're one billion. So you need a billion of them to equal one meter, I like that. And this is what you should use when you do conversions. Bigger unit, smaller number. Smaller unit, bigger number. I take uh, Emma's body, we measure the length of the science wing, and we get, I don't know, 47, okay? Take Grodsky's body and measure it, we get 27. How come I'm, there's less of me to measure because my unit is bigger, so bigger, the unit smaller the number. Smaller the unit, bigger how many you need to equal each other, okay? So the first step is I'm gonna convert to meters. I know people can figure out how to go directly to centimeters, but I'll just do that. So I take my what? Lattice constant, 291, that I got from crystallography, which is the what? It's nothing more than that dimension, picometers. I wanna get rid of picometers, so where do they go? The bottom and I want meters. Now one meter, heck, that's a big unit. Small number, smaller unit, bigger number. So one times 10, you need a lot of them. Billion of them, one times 10 to the 12. Get rid of picometers, and now I've got my value. Okay, it's gonna be a small number, but I don't want meters, I want centimeters, because I want centimeters cubed. That's the goal. So I get rid of meter, and how many centimeters are in a meter? 100, right? Because centa is 100. Could you do it one step? And, and yeah, you could, but I'm tall. All right, so watch how I do it. I'm gonna take 291, okay, times one, same thing as one. Divide by, here comes my exponential. One times 10 to the negative 12, I would do, I would, I have to put one there. I'm gonna go second function, E, E, key. It's blinking, right? That's these one in, times 10 to the what? 12, just type in 12. Okay, I'll enter, and I'll times 100. And lo and behold, or high and behold, Okay, we get the dimension of the simple unit cell of that body-centered uh, cubic structure to be 2.91 times 10 
So negative eight centimeters. That's the lattice constant in centimeters. And since we're trying to make a volume in centimeters cubed, and by the way, what's a centimeter cubed? A centimeter by a centimeter by a centimeter, it's an awful cube that I just drew. But if I have a centimeter by centimeter by centimeter, one milliliter fits in there. So a centimeter cube is a milliliter. Okay, almost done. So take your calculator. Since we're gonna do what? Length times width times height to get our volume, all we're gonna do is cube this. So I'm gonna go to my handy dandy calculator. I'm gonna go to math, okay? And I'm gonna use the third, that's a cube. Hit enter. Answer cubed, 2.46, 2.46 to Christmas. 2.46 times 10 to the negative 23. And what's the unit? Centimeters cubed. And now party people, I can now solve for the density without dropping in water, without measuring anything other than using light. Pretty darn cool. Now, I've got this number in my calculator. Why would I erase to put this one and do this one? I'm gonna take this number, divide by that, and do what? Hit the inverse key. So I'm gonna take this number, I know it's the right answer, but I'm gonna divide by 1.73. So divide by 1.73. Okay, times 10, which again, exponential, second function, EE. E. Okay, to the negative 22, so negative 22. And I get that ugly answer, but that's not my answer because I was just being lazy. I didn't want to cancel it off, so I'm going to hit the X to the negative 1 to, to flip it. X to the negative 1 key, enter. And booyah, I get a number that I can like I can grab a hold of. All these other numbers are just too small. And so my density, duh, is equal to 7.02 what? Grams per centimeter cubed. And hey, does that make any sense? Well, party people, if you go to your regents reference tables. Okay, chromium is atomic number 24. We have a table S, S, S. You go to atomic number 24 and you find chromium and it gives you the density to be 7.15. So a very comparable number, okay? And the units they're using for density, grams per what? Centimeter cubed, all right? So we got a comparable number. By the way, this might be a different set of conditions. All right, take a break.